first year of university, um, I actually uh, had a lots of partying and did lots of partying and, uh, uh, and, and actually uh, I, I failed my first exam. Uh, and a little bit about that later, but nevertheless, I finished that university, went on after that university because I did pure mathematics with, uh, uh, and theoretical mathematics. So I wanted to apply mathematics in career world problems and I wanted to study at the best university in the world. So I was like, okay, um, where shall I go? I didn't want to go to America. So I decided to come to Oxford. So in Oxford, I did my MSc, and then after I finished my MSc, I realized I want to use, I actually want to work in the area which has more data, although I was in applied mathematics department, but still there was not enough data, and even the applied mathematics felt very pure. So I went uh, to the Center for uh, um, Medical Imaging, which is the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Brain, and then did my DPhil, and there had a chance to actually see lots of data and do more uh, applications that were closer to real world. So I did my DPhil there, and did my postdoc there, and after that I um, came to uh, UCL, where I did my postdoc, a fellowship and lectureship, and then I'm an associate professor. So when you look at this, and I present this often at talks, you know, everybody is just like, okay, <laughs> that looks really cool, you know, it looks so smooth, you know, from like, you know, nowhere to somewhere, and like, you know, everything looks like, you know, pff, this girl, you know, like, <laughs> like everything was going really well for her. But in reality, it was more like this. You know, an academic path is like climbing a Mount Everest. It's like, you know, every bit of the way there are so many challenges and there are so many setbacks. And I very often in my life actually had to put this picture in front of me and then divide those steps in little pieces so that I can like achieve one goal after another very carefully. And on the way, <laughs> so many fails. I was lucky, one of my favorite sports, skiing, so when I joined, I started skiing when I was seven. The first thing they taught us in the first class was how to fall. First class, go, 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 fall. No, no, not like that, like this. <laughs> so not like this. Uh, but the first thing they teach you is how to fall. In that moment, I just kind of realized, okay, so falling is gonna be part of life, and I'll basically just be having to learn how to fall many times so I can learn to be a really good skier. I embraced that strategy. As I said earlier, my first exam ever at the university was a fail. I mean, I, after all that parting that I mentioned happened, because you know, after so many years of mathematics, I was like, <laughs> 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 there had to be some loosening of it. So it was really bad. I went to this professor, I still remember him. This is linear algebra, so it was an exam in linear algebra. And I told him, um, I'm so sorry, I, can, I, can I like submit my coursework later? Can I just submit my exam later? Can I get an extension? And he just looked at me. <laughs> With that kind of despise, you know, kind of like, <laughs> kind of, ah. Oh. <laughs> you know, students these days. <laughs> that really hurt. <laughs> I went back home <laughs> and stopped partying and really started working. After four years, I finished top, top percent of my class at that university. But for me, that was a major push. So what I learned then, to not be influenced by critical people in a negative way, is turn it into your advantage. Use that experience to really motivate you and to build resilience because they don't know you. They can despise you and they can think of this or that, but they don't really know you. They can't criticize you. They only know one moment of your life, but not who you are. After that, as I said, I went to Oxford. And then during my DPhil, well, I was a, an ambitious DPhil student, and I really, really was determined to get a JRF at Oxford. And I don't know how many went to Oxford, but in Oxford there is this elusive thing which is called the Junior Research Fellowship that PhD students can apply for. 
it's a fellowship that you know you're basically attached to a college. You have a right to attend, you know, beautiful you know, high table, you know, dinners, drink, <laughs> meet like all these prominent, uh, you know, university professors. Um, and so I really, really wanted it. But there's Nick Trefetten, who was a head of the numerical analysis lab in Oxford, told me at the time it was one of the most difficult things to achieve, <laughs> much harder than actual other more serious fellowships, because we are talking about almost no money really, or sometimes a bit of money. It's just about kind of privilege. And I tried. Here is just one section of all the submissions and all the applications that I copied from my folder uh, to so many different colleges. I mean, this is one fifth. I actually applied, must be like 15 colleges. I went to interviews. In one particular interview at Jesus College, they were like, and everything was gone, kind of. Okay, and then there's this professor there who asked me, ah, in your CV here, I see that you published in the preceding, or in the, in the PNAS, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And I was still a PhD student. And this is a very, very eminent journal. So he was like, wow, you know, so what did you do? So truly, you know, I actually developed a software that they used, which I teach they couldn't actually publish this paper. But at that moment, I said, yeah, you know, for this group, you know, the, these you know, guys, you know, they came, they asked me, you know, could you help us a little bit with this? <laughs> and then <laughs> I kind of like, you know, started working, you know, did a bit of this, bit of this, that, and then I did help them. They were looking at me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I never got that fellowship. Yeah? It was just a few couple of fellowships later, once I learned a lesson to really, really, really prepare for my interviews, that I got a fellowship. And that was at the Pembroke uh, College in Oxford. And that was really amazing. Uh, amazing two years. But what I really, really, really learned was first to just keep trying. You know, in the Dora, in the just keep trying to. <laughs> That's the attitude. We think like this in academia. It's fun. Just keep trying. And always, but always, prepare for interviews. I do not know anybody, even the most advanced, the most amazing people, are not going to be good if they don't prepare for their interview. So always do that. Moving on, so then when I got my PhD, so you are a doctor, so now what? So, you know, there are, I mean, probably you are at this point, most of your PhD students are thinking what to do next. So, you know, the options are, because all of, at that point, all you want to do, you know, is become an academic at some point and get this, you know, permanent post, which is kind of like a, you know, um, a carrot <laughs> ahead of you. But how do we get there? So the most obvious ways, which I was advised when I was in my PhD, was you know you need to get a fellowship to become a lectureship. So I thought, okay, I'm going to apply to get a fellowship. Uh, I actually also applied for a lectureship at that point. Two lectureship applications. One was Imperial, and the other one was Oxford. But no one ever even responded. So uh, I just gave up on that option. Uh, and applied for the Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship. So this was the feedback, but there was lots and lots of words before that, and um, uh, you, know, you know, about me and everything. But this person had two concerns, so I was shortlisted. I was the first below the cutoff. They put me in the reserve, but at the end I didn't get it. And they had two concerns. Firstly, the work that I proposed was an extension of my PhD work. And so, you know, staying in Oxford didn't look interesting. They thought it's actually bad for my career. And secondly, uh, that they wanted the proposal to be wider, to be something more, you know, not just like the stuff that I was doing for my PhD. So I really, really took this on board. I mean, I, 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 I realized that maybe I'm actually not ready from that position that I was to actually get a fellowship. So instead, I came to UCL to do a postdoc in a completely different area and to learn something new. And what I learned then was 
ask for feedback. I got that feedback because I actually emailed the fellowship organization. I said, can you please send me the feedback about this? And then they did. Usually they don't. Um, you know, listen to some of the advice that you get. See what's there. You know, maybe you are, you need to do something extra. And what I learned at that point was that there, are, there was, it was a time, obviously, for me that I need to learn more. And sometimes you just can't go straight up on the ladder. Sometimes you need to step sideways. Sideways a few times until you have enough grounds so that you can go up. So after the postdoc, <laughs> uh, the next step was, OK, how do I now get the permanent post? So uh, I first, uh, while I was doing my postdoc, I mean, I mean, I was at UCL, things were going really well. I was uh, publishing papers and everything. Um, I applied again for Dorothy Hodgkin, which I didn't get because it was just too soon. And I just switched the area. So I waited a couple of years, published more papers in this new area, applied for Livihum, got the Livihum. And just before getting the Livihum, uh, there was an opportunity here at UCL for, uh, for lectureship. And I was extremely and heavily pregnant at the time. So I went to this, I, I got an interview, and I was at the interview. And this was, um, I actually had a, uh, to um, do a talk just before the interview. And this was <laughs> a car that they promised me on that day, that because I was five days before giving birth. Yeah? So even the interview date was moved so that I could actually attend the interview. <laughs> Dave just spoke to me before the interview while I was, you know, kind of holding and heavily breathing. Everything is okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> There's a car outside. <laughs> In case you need it. <laughs> so I gave my talk. I had my interview. Um, however, I wasn't the first shortlisted. I considered that a failure for me. But also, however, I was really, really good at that interview. Say so they, they actually opened position for me. But me, to make sure that I will get the position, I got the Leverhulme Transfer Fellowship. And I went to another university for an interview there for a lectureship, got an offer there as well, and then came back and said, you know, by the way, if you know, don't do that. <laughs> No, I'm joking. I didn't actually say it that way. But it just looked really good, you know. So what I learned that first, people around you will support you. Ask for help. Knowing people around you is really, really important. It's just because we are a community. And very often, you know, it's good. Uh, uh, people, people learn who you are and how, you know, what your value is from knowing you. And also, secondly, a lost battle does not mean that you lost the war. Be patient and just strengthen further. Just wait and work, work, build, and the opportunity will come. So, tips. Capital is on your best assets. We are all good at different things. You don't have to be an amazing and fast paper writer, but you are amazing you're maybe amazing at talking to people and presenting your work. You'll be surprised, for example, how much presenting your work is important. Uh, second, publish those papers one at a time. I mean, I know it sounds simple, but actually it's quite hard. Be because, you know, we always have so many different strands of work and so many, you know, research goes in so many different directions. And actually, it's quite hard sometimes to actually channel these things into a specific paper. And we always delay things and postpone them. But no, you know, choose something, you know, draw yourself a path and just follow that path until it's finished. Especially if you're the first author. If you can't finish something, give it to somebody else and be a second author. I found that works really well. And for the things where you can't even give it to someone else, drop them. But don't let them hang in your head. So that's what I mean by this sentence. Third, be prepared. I actually saw this sentence. It's not my idea, but I loved it. A friend of mine said this. That true luck is when a preparation and an opportunity meet. 
So people say, you know, I never get opportunities in life, and I'm so unlucky. But actually, you don't need 100 opportunities. You need one. But you just need to be prepared for that one. So this is why the preparation is much more important than how many opportunities go down your way. That fourth, be yourself with confidence, but also learn to be your best self. And being your best self means doing things like this, means learning, means training, means really maximizing your potential. Find a mentor. There's plenty of wise academics around, and everybody will be happy to do that. I mean, just like yesterday, I had an email from a girl who met me on the stairs and talked about work-life family balance, and she emailed me and said, oh, please, can we meet to share some tips? And I said, of course I will. And all academics will do that. You just need to ask. And don't be too hard on yourself. Everybody struggles. Tap your shoulders <laughs> on the shoulder from time to time, because you are doing your best. And everybody struggles. It's true. I mean, look at this. We are doing this just to show that everybody has their failures. If you need sources of inspiration and further lists of failures, you can actually look online. I don't know if anybody's seen this. This is one of the best CVs I've ever seen. This CV is literally like a CV where each selection is a set of failures, whatever all these things that, this, uh, uh, that uh, Johannes Hausford did. And my favorite is his meta failure. This darn CV of failures has received way more attention than my entire body of <laughs> academic work. <laughs> I'm so thoroughly impressed. But there are plenty of people like that out there. So look for these things. Balance. It's not enough to just you know, do one thing. I mean, actually, it can work if you really, really want it. You know, like if you really, really uh, narrow and re really, really want to achieve something. But it's really nice to be balanced and to have, so in all my life, I really like to practice lots of sports, you know, volleyball, and, you know, skiing and, you know, family and children and many pregnancies. So actually, if there's anybody here, <laughs> twins, <laughs> talking about challenges, and if you ever want to hear about challenges, I was bombed. I was <laughs> for three months in Serbia. I have health issues on various different degrees and levels. I've had Crohn's disease for many years. Uh, you know, critical uh, giving birth of one child, uh, twins, uh, times in hospital, name it, problems breastfeeding. Um, but, uh, you know, it all kind of works out well. You just need to kind of take it on. It's life. It's fun. And it's nice to keep this balance, to have all of those things around you together with your work. And remember, to use your past self as your inspiration. I mean, you are here for a reason. I mean, you all had to go through so many failures so far yourself and so many challenges to be here in the first place. How did you achieve that? Always remember that. Because then you will remember, ah, oh, that's what I did. You are your best inspiration for yourself. That is all. So if anybody is interested in anything more uh, or any other stories, these are just really a few of my failures, but I had millions. I was just very keen to find the ones that would be relevant for you and for your stage in life. But you're interested in any other please <laughs> let me know. I'll be very, very happy to answer uh, any, any, any of your requests. Thank you. Thank you.